This is Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski with my co-host, Joel L. Kahn, and we're joined by Andrew Shannon. He is the CEO of Pure Funds. Pure Funds specializes in bringing first mover concepts to the market via ETFs. Andrew, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks so much for having me. To get things started, can you share a little bit of your background and tell us how you became the Pure Fund CEO before even turning 30? Sure. So, uh, fortunately, uh, right out of university, I was able to get experience working for one of the largest ETF specialist firms at the time, Kellogg Group, oh, okay. on, the floor of the, on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. And there, I worked my way up from clerk to becoming one of the youngest ever lead market makers for ETFs on the ARCA exchange during the New York and Amex um, takeover. And um, through that, I got great experience trading all types of ETFs and made a lot of issuer relationships. And uh, they kind of suggested, you know, why do you keep on giving us ETF ideas, which we had been doing because there were ETF ideas that that we had wanted to trade that weren't out there yet. He said, you know, why do you keep on giving us your ideas? Just try launching your own. So um, with a partner of mine, we uh, created Pure Funds um, in 2010. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, other individuals in the company didn't necessarily want to, um, or they they wanted to to pursue other opportunities. And uh, it left me with uh, the position of CEO. So it's been, you know, a fantastic experience and, kind of having worked on all different sides of the ETF space before made it you know, a great fit and one that I was really uh, eager to take on. Hey, go big or go home, right? <laughs> so what, what's your overall take on the market right now? Sure. You know, I think we're in very interesting times. You just look at across all different types of asset classes, and we're seeing really interesting things. You know, uh, fixed income seems uh, you know, you're getting historically low yields on your investments. Uh, broad-based equity markets, um, you know, in uh, in the U.S. have been uh, near record highs recently, and uh, and you know a lot of commodities are actually doing uh, historically poorly relative to those other asset classes. So we actually do also have a silver fund, which I think is you know interesting given that silver has sold off so much. Um, so you know, I, I think that there are still pockets of opportunities out there, and that's kind of what Pure Funds is trying to do. We're trying to focus on these uh, thematic growth areas within the tech space. And, and, and to kind of carve up those areas, remove some more of those mature industries, and find those uh, areas that we believe investors are, are looking for um, exposure to in these kind of thematic growth areas. So Pure Funds has the only cybersecurity pure play ETF. Uh, that's ticker HACK, H-A-C-K. How did the ETF reach a market cap of more than $1 billion in less than a year? Uh, subsequently, after launching, there, there has been um, another another one that's come to market. But this this was the first um, the first fund to ever focus on cybersecurity, uh, especially in ETFs. And and this was a theme that I think had been kind of growing in investors' minds that they wanted to get exposure to. But it is such a complex industry, one that is constantly changing. And because of that, it can be a volatile market for investors to pick individual securities in. So even if you are an expert, it, it can be very difficult to pick those names that can properly round out a portfolio, giving investors exposure to all the various different types of cybersecurity um, protection and solutions that are out there. So it made actually a ton of sense for us to launch an ETF that would give investors exposure to the diverse types of technologies and solutions out there for cybersecurity prevention while getting this global exposure, because it is a global industry. It's one that's been growing year over year. And you know, to, to get that kind of uh, instant diversification through an ETF over 30-plus companies really appeal to investors. And so I think investors that had been interested but had been nervous to get into the space because they didn't know the space that well have seen this as a vehicle to get that exposure, as well as people that were already choosing individual securities that wanted to maybe remove some of that volatility from their from their investment. So I think it's, it really um, caught on to investors. And then obviously the Sony attack that happened two weeks after we launched and the Anthem hack and every single subsequent hack has just brought more attention right. to the industry. And I think it's been something that investors have been happy to find a solution such as uh, an ETF to play this space. How many stocks does the hack ETF hold and what are some of its biggest holdings? 
Sure. So currently there are 32 companies in the fund. The largest three holdings are Fortinet, Imperva, and Proofpoint. As of yesterday, obviously holdings are subject to change, and we do post um, all the holdings as of the previous night's close up on our website for anyone interested in reviewing that. And we have a bunch of other interesting material at pureetfs.com about the funds. Uh, Fortinet is a next-gen firewall company, and Perva focuses on web application security and firewalls. And Proofpoint deals with uh, APT, or Advanced Threat Protection, um, and uh, email security. So I- I'm guessing, you know, Fortinet and those others that you just mentioned are, are among, in your opinion, the leaders in the cybersecurity sector right now. Who else kind of stands out to you? What names? Sure. So, this, I, you know, it, it's so tough to choose, you know, who's going to be the winner, you know, a year from now because oh, sure. it is a constantly evolving space. And there are new, um, you know, smaller companies IPOing very regularly. So, you know, it, it's one of these ones that you have to really stay on top of or kind of invest in the broader theme. Um, but companies that have been uh, getting a lot of attention recently, uh, companies like uh, Palo Alto Networks also having next-gen firewalls, CyberArk, which um, just the other day reported very strong earnings. They do privileged account security, uh, FireEye as well, um, malware protection. And interestingly, uh, it, seem, it seems that whenever a major company gets hacked, they look for someone to help consult on um, what they can do to, to, to prevent it, what actually happened, and how to go forward. And um, FireEye also offers a, another arm of their company, which is a consulting service under the umbrella Mandiant. Um, so they've kind of been a, a go-to for companies trying to uh, recover from cyber attacks. Are there any cybersecurity stocks that you think investors should avoid or that you're thinking of avoiding? You know, it, it's, it, it's something I think, you know, uh, people that we talk to, everyone has different opinions. Some companies in the space, they say, okay, they're too mature, or some companies maybe don't have the pure play focus, or some companies don't necessarily um, put as much R&D into trying to uh, figure out how to prevent the next um, stem of breaches and, and attacks. Um, so you know, I, I think it's almost a dangerous question trying to, you know, to, to pick specific winners and losers. But, you know, I think one of the neat things about ETFs is if you want to play the theme, you, you could invest in the ETF. And if there are names that you don't like for whatever reason, you could short those names to kind of hedge, hedge that, that risk in your mind for your portfolio. Given the amount of cyber attacks we've seen lately, and you just mentioned a few of them, do you think investors are paying enough attention to the cybersecurity sector? Yeah, I, I think it's one that's almost uh, unavoidable to, to to not be able to pay attention to. You'd almost have to be sticking your head in the sand and leaving it there if you're not seeing these attacks. And everything that w- that we hear points to um, you know more attacks, uh, higher sophistication of the attacks, and unfortunately increased damages of these attacks. So the more the more data that companies have, the more uh, intellectual property, trade secrets. Um, you know, the, the more information that's out there, there's more value to actually be accessed or breached from these cyber attacks. So I think it's it's making um, you know cy- cyber criminals uh, you know th- that much more excited about the opportunity on their space. So you know it, I think it's it's very um, it, 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 it provides a unique opportunity for investors to have exposure to these companies that when there are increased cyber attacks typically companies and governments are going to spend more on cybersecurity solutions and companies in that space should most likely be the ones receiving those increased spendings and helping their revenue stream. Well, like I mentioned at the top of the show, Pure Fund specializes in bringing first mover concepts to the market. So you guys also just launched a mobile payments ETF. I'm really interested in this. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So exactly, we like we said, we're looking to create these um, these in, uh, these investments for people that want these specific themes. And with mobile payments, we did just that. Uh, mobile payments refers to mobile, electronic, and digital payments. And in the fund, it contains companies that are um, processors, solution providers, infrastructure and software, and card networks, all within the the broader mobile payment ecosystem. And we think that this is a very interesting area right now. If you look at the, the overall global uh, transaction and payments industry, um, over the last several years, 
consistently mobile payments has been taking a larger part of that market share of, of overall payments and transactions. So this is kind of a technology play, but it's also a financial play. If you look at broad-based financial or technology ETFs, you don't really get the exposure to this industry. So we're carving out this kind of what has been a growth area within the transaction and payment industry and providing that for investors. So, you know, like we said, you know, that you have these different types of companies within the ecosystem. It's also another global basket, over 30 companies. And you know, different trends in addition to um, you know, just taking a larger market share of the, of the industry is that we're seeing that mobile payments have the ability to provide um, you know, cheaper transactions, ease of use, and the speed of transaction, which seems that for our modern uh, generations, that this is something that people demand and more and more younger and more and more affluent um, uh, consumers are switching over to these technologies more and more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the fintech sector is growing pretty rapidly when you have things like Apple Pay coming out and just starting to gain traction. So what are some of the, can you tell me some of the top components of the ETF? Yep, so um, the three of the top holdings are Visa, MasterCard, PayPal. Um, so, you know, the, the first two are some of the more familiar names on the card network side. PayPal, uh, obviously, as, as you probably well know, recently spun out from, uh, from eBay. Right. And, you know, we're excited to have that company in the fund as well as, you know, they're a huge player in the mobile payment space. But, you know, I think... Part of the interesting thing about this is it is uh, kind of an evolving industry where you have these smaller companies too in the space. I think you know so, some of the other uh, companies that people might not be uh, as familiar with um, are, are, are companies like Fiserv, and they offer solutions for all aspects of mobile payment ecosystems. They do person-to-person sales, bill payment, um, payment at point of sales, and um, have a broad range of mobile payment models for merchant companies. And then things like if you're driving in New York City and in the back of a taxi and you need to pay, there's a good chance you may see a Verifone um, hard, hardware app, uh, uh, piece in the back of the cab where you actually swipe your credit card. So this is really taking in these um, wow. you know, uh, different pieces. And the neat thing, too, is as digital and cryptocurrencies evolve and more companies um, evolve in there, the index is uh, built to take into um, account those companies as well into this growing ecosystem. Wow, that's pretty cool. You have another ETF that you recently launched, and that focuses on big data. Uh, Can you kind of give your definition of big data for members of our audience who may not be familiar with it? Sure. So everyone has uh, different different uh, definitions, right. but what we, we what we kind of go with are the three V's: volume, velocity, and variety of large data sets. And the volume is kind of the amount that's coming in. The velocity is the speed at which it's coming in, and the variety is the diverse types of data, whether it be text or JPEG or audio or things like that. Um, and then you know, th- this is how companies are actually. Um, uh, companies that are generating products and services that allow for the creation, management, and analysis of these large data sets. So can you tell us a little bit about the the Peer Funds ISE Big Data ETF and what the main components of it are? Sure. So um, uh, kind of expanding on it, so we've broken it down into data aggregators, originators, applications, and solution providers. And we think of this as a, a neat way to kind of uh, break down and categorize this industry because, we, we, like I said, we are the first ones doing this, and we're kind of defining this, uh, this, this definition as far as an investable product goes. So that was one of the really exciting things about creating this product was you know, really trying to, to break down this industry and finding those areas that would be of interest to people trying to, to, to uh, invest in the big data revolution. So uh, with, within here, we have companies like Google that everyone's uh, you know, very familiar with. They track uh, user searches. People are constantly um, you know, putting that information in. And with all these searches, they've been able to figure out things like the, the spread of the flu and, uh, and other things like that. They also own YouTube, which is one of the largest, uh, if not the largest um, provider, uh, uh, owner of content mm-hmm. for, for video. And it's just all these different streams of things that they have that is providing all this data, which hopefully they'll be able to extract the full value of that and, and come up with 
um, new innovations from all this information that they have. Another company that's large holding is Facebook. Um, you know, they have what what's at Messenger, which is people just sending messages back and forth with their friends, and that is all data. And obviously, you have Facebook, which has uh, text, links, pictures, videos. And Instagram, which was a huge purchase for them, which is one of the largest um, uh, uh, databases of, of photos yeah. on the internet. And you have uh, IBM with Watson. And I think one of the more interesting things too is people will look at the top ten holdings and they'll say, "Okay, I know those companies. Sure, they're big companies." But I, I, I think it's very appealing if you actually go and you look at the rest of the holdings. We have companies that people might not be as familiar with that are, are very interesting players in the space, like Tableau. They're a, they do data analytics for business by using virtualization. And Hortonworks, they, um, they have huge customers, eBay, Bloomberg, Spotify. They provide open source databases which allow for data aggregation so their clients can better understand and utilize the actual data that they have. So it's been really, really neat trying to um, define this industry and knowing that big data is a huge theme at many of the large investment research houses. Uh, we are, we're, we're happy to provide this first solution for investors. We're on the line with Andrew Channon. He's the CEO of Pure Funds and uh, is coming up with some pretty interesting ETFs. Um, Andrew, I just want to go back to you, your days as a market maker. I see you had a career on the, on the Amex with a uh, Kellogg, Spear League, Kellogg is a market maker, and you know you're using that knowledge to put together to the ETFs here. Um, any comments on on market structure and high frequency trading? I mean, it's a you know it, it's kind of quiet, and then something happens. You have a couple flash crashes in the stock here. I mean, just your observations over the you know the last few years. I mean, is the mar- is the market structure? I mean, do we have a stable market structure? Yeah, you know that, that's 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 a, a very interesting question. And just one one, one correction: it was uh, uh, I worked at Kellogg Group, which was actually the son of the uh, the one of the founders of Spearleaf Kellogg. So not okay. the same company, but but very similar. But the uh, you, you know I, I think we've learned a lot about what's going on. I think a lot of high frequency trading was kind of you know backdoor, very secret, uh, backroom, very secretive. And now people are becoming more aware of its existence. I think that's very good because it's shining light on it. And you know, I think one misconception is that it's it, that that high frequency trading is binary, and by that I mean it's either good or it's bad. And I think that's a huge misconception. I think there are practices of high frequency trading which could be considered predatory and, and bad for general market participants, but there's also a part of high frequency trading which is very beneficial to markets because without high frequency trading you would see much wider spreads, which would make overall trading much more expensive. And some of these uh, high-frequency trading, say you want to you want to buy something and you put it in a market order. Well, some of these high-frequency trading strategies are actually trying to get that trade ahead of their um, competitors, so you might even get a better price than what you saw as available. So you know, it, it's something where... You know, th- there are good practices, there are bad practices, and hopefully the, the regulatory authorities as well as the leaders in the financial industry will work together to, to create something that, that um, you know, penalizes or removes the bad components while supporting the good components. We've been on the line with Andrew Shannon. He is the CEO of Pure Funds. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We will definitely have to bring you back on the show. Looking forward to it, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Have a great day.